All right. Well, welcome to our session uh, today, modeling how to use OSM in the classroom. My name is Greg Hill, and I teach at Horn High School in Mesquite, Texas, uh, which is just east of Dallas. Uh, I teach geography, and soon I'll be adding African American studies. Uh, and this is like my fourth or fifth year teaching uh, or using OpenStreetMaps. And my name is Celeste Reynolds, and I teach at Mashpee High School, where I teach uh, AP Human Geography, Current Events, Women's Studies, and uh, and we'll be teaching U.S. History for the first time next year. So, uh, and I've been using Open Street Mapping for the past five years in my classroom. So our, today our workshop objectives, we wanna explain the why of mapping. That's a really big part uh, that we feel has been a missing piece of trying to connect um, teachers, college professors, uh, what have you, and educators in general uh, of connecting them with open street maps because oftentimes you go to an open street map workshop and you know, you'll find, you know, this, this is how to do it. Uh, this is how you, uh, you know, map buildings, but the missing piece for educators oftentimes is the why. Why should I be using this? What's, how can I incorporate that into our curriculum? And so we hope to do that as well as provide some real life examples of how to use OSM in your classroom. Uh, and we'd like to kind of simulate that in the classroom lesson piece, if you will, um, and provide some information of how, you know, some additional resources, uh, support mechanisms and organizations that are out there to help you uh, facilitate that. So when we're looking at incorporating open street mapping in the classroom, uh, it's important to introduce students, you know, wh why, you know, a lot of people say, why should I incorporate open street mapping? Um, it's trying to introduce students to the open street mapping community so that they can become part of this community, not just in the classroom, but for life. Um, trying to get students to actively engage in actually creating maps, not consuming maps. Many times uh, as teachers, uh, we like to cons uh, have our students consume maps, like analyze them, see what they're saying. But how about showing students how to make a map, how to contribute to a map? Uh, is there something that you're seeing on maps that isn't there that they would like to put on there? And I think that's really important, showing them the how. And then uh, showing students why and how to use open street mapping, I think that that's really important of kind of explaining, um, yes, this is a tool, but this is why this tool is very effective uh, in solving problems and, and, um, and how it can help many communities, even their own. And then looking at trying to get students to think about ways how they can help others, um, not in their community, but also in the world. Uh, especially in the time of COVID, uh, open street mapping was a wonderful tool of helping students try to find a way to help others uh, as they're sitting at home, um, help to give them kind of hope and servicing others uh, and not leaving their home, which was really, uh, really a neat way of helping students um, do that service learning piece. And then trying to also show students uh, how to apply uh, real world uh, problems. Like here we have some real world problems. How can we solve those? And would a map help us solving those problems? Uh, and I think that that's really important. And like I've said before, uh, any way that you can take your curriculum and apply it so that they're doing service learning uh, and taking it and applying it to helping others is a huge advantage for your students. Um, and then getting them civically engaged, uh, civically engaged in their community and their world. And I think that that is very uh, important um, for we instructors or educators to show students how they can do that. Furthermore on the why, um, we are as geographers are spatial people. We like to think in spatial terms and we ask spatial questions about spatial things. We, we often look at how 
people and, and animals and different phenomena operate in those different spaces. And OpenStreetMap gives a great opportunity for students and educators alike to uh, kind of not only quantify what's happening in that space, but also to kind of look at things like change over time um, and, and, you know, where are people on the map and where people aren't on the map. Uh, so we also look at the question of what happened um, in the case of natural disasters or some other humanitarian crisis. What happened? Where did it occur? And who and, and what is affected? Who are the, who are the people that are, are what we tend to uh, look at as the most vulnerable? Uh, and, and what happens is oftentimes there are a lot of people, whether it be different populations, different sectors of society that have the greatest need, but, but government maps or, or even uh, corporate maps, as I like to call them, or for profit maps, don't have their information. And so we tend to have uh, uh, the idea of trying to make the invisible uh, visible. Uh, and so maps and data kind of helps us to answer those geographic questions and kind of bring to like the missing pieces that are missing uh, in terms of, of, of proprietary maps and other maps. Uh, and OpenStreetMap helps us to do that. So in terms of uh, the amount of, of unmapped places by continent, you can see here by um, uh, this particular graphic that there is so many opportunities for students to map locally as well as globally. Um, you know, with Africa and, and Asia being probably the two uh, biggest uh, areas that stick out on this particular graphic, but even in, in North America, even in, in, in Latin America, there are places that still aren't mapped. And this is not an all-encompassing uh, number because even still, for example, locally in Mesquite, there are new structures going up. There are 800 new homes that are going to go up within the next five to 10 years around our campus, and they're not even on the map. Right now, they're grasslands areas, some are agricultural lands, and soon that will change and it, that stuff will need to be mapped. And plethora of uses that we could have, you know, in terms of uh, school attendance boundaries uh, for first responders and mapping out their needs and, and, and putting out resources in those different areas. So when we're looking at trying to talk to educators, we're trying to get them to think about who are the most vulnerable because usually the most vulnerable people in the world are the people that are not mapped. Uh, and so we try to look at informal settlements, for example, refugee camps, internal displacement, uh, over urbanization, squatter settlements, uh, and, and also rural settlements. Uh, a lot of places in the United States uh, in rural communities are not mapped. Just a year ago, I am from a small town in Illinois, about 1,500 people, and uh, I found out that my Mount Pulaski, Illinois was not mapped in open street mapping, and all the little towns where my friends and family live um, have not been mapped. So there's a lot of places even here in the United States uh, that are not mapped as well. So when we're looking at missing maps and areas, um, there's millions and millions of the world's most vulnerable people, like I said before, that are missing and not accounted. And when we think about this, uh, I think it's really important to kind of emphasize to our students that if people are not mapped, then they might not be put into consideration when governments or corporations are making decisions about how they're going to use that land. And I think that that's something to really think about. Uh, and so if we have this many people that are not being mapped, um, they're not being considered while they're, while governments are making big decisions about those areas as well as those people. And so it's also, if they're not mapped, it's very difficult to provide services and resources to those people that probably need it the most. And I think that that's something that a lot of students don't, really are aware of and um, really think about. And this is one way to really get them to think about um, how many people are not mapped and how many people need to get mapped so that they can get the resources and the services that they need to, to live a quality of life. 
And so uh, I, I want to use a, a prime example we often use in OpenStreetMap of, of, of the why. I often use this in my classroom, and it brings a, it kind of uh, brightens a lot of my students' eyes in terms of, you know, why not just Google it? Well, great example that's often used in the OpenStreetMap community is the 2010 earthquake in Haiti, um, in which it just devastated uh, that part of the island of Hispaniola. Um, and so, you know, you had 1.5 million people uh, that contribute to OpenStreetMap worldwide, but in this particular instance, uh, hundreds uh, of thousands of people came together. Um, and, and so OpenStreetMap is a crowdsourced map of the world. If you have, anybody can jump on it. Anybody can volunteer their time and jump on and, and add and edit the map, uh, so to speak. Um, and so through what I like to call as participatory mapping, uh, it creates a bridge between communities and services. And in this case, in Haiti, uh, mappers all over the world, just at their desktop, were able to uh, create the most, um, uh, probably the best, most detailed map of Port-au-Prince to this date. Um, and it's still used by government agencies. Uh, so when, you know, shortly after the earthquake, uh, the, the Haitian government was devastated. They, they were really crippled. Um, they were crippled to begin with. I'm going to go ahead and say that. But they were further crippled by the earthquake. They weren't able to get out uh, services and, and aid to people. Um, it was already an economically uh, challenged country. And so uh, the U.S. State Department, USAID, as long as uh, branches of the U.S. military, were able to come in and using that open street map data, were able to garner where do resources need to be, where do these resources need to go, um, so they could efficiently... Uh, help the people. Um, and even to this day, we're still there helping people in a variety of capacities. Um, and so uh, whether it be in Haiti, whether it be in Kiribati, whether it be even locally um, in Logan County, County Illinois, um, participatory mapping kind of gets the kids to see, kind of goes back to what Celeste said about uh, service learning, that they're actually doing something for someone without actually having to go there. So who is using OpenStreetMap data? Uh, you have groups like the Red Cross who are really big uh, users and, and consumers of, of, of OpenStreetMap data. Uh, they're also um, some of the biggest uh, project managers. They create a lot of projects and sites like uh, Hot OSM, uh, Wikipedia, Facebook has developed uh, a, a several um, apps, if you will, that uses OpenStreetMap data that helps them in, in their particular uh, programs, uh, including Instagram. Uh, Microsoft uh, is also a big player, and, and they've uh, just recently par partnered with TeachOSM to create, uh, uh, help uh, facilitate the creation of uh, educational modules that you as an educator, whether in the high school level or in the college level, uh, could use in your classroom. Um, and more of that will be coming out at uh, teachosm.org. Uh, the New York Times, Washington Post, if you look at a lot of the, the uh, maps used by Washington Post, if you look on the underlying layers uh, in the credits, you'll see OpenStreetMap uh, as, as the contributor. And probably one of my favorites uh, is Lyft. Uh, and I use that as a great example because I can show if I'm a pre-COVID, and it's something I probably said a lot this year for a lot of my lessons, pre-COVID, this area was like this. Uh, but pre-COVID, I used Lyft quite a bit in a lot of my travels, and I was able to show my students uh, how Lyft tracked uh, where I was going or they anticipated. For example, I used to go to New York quite a bit uh, for uh, conferences like with the American Geographical Society, and I was able to show them that Lyft kind of anticipated that, hey, are you going here uh, using data from OpenStreetMaps, but also from some of my uh, user history. And this is just uh, for, for teachers and educators uh, who are new to open street mapping, uh, kind of thinking of different organizations that they can look into that will provide resources and information to help get you started. And uh, Missing Maps, uh, HOT, I use HOT quite a bit in my classroom when I'm looking for projects on different topics. Uh, that I can go to and start to say, hey, what's going on in the news? And I can go on to HOT and find a project. And I mostly look for beginner projects because my students 
are not uh, very advanced mappers. They're usually being introduced to open street mapping. But these are, um, I look for beginner mapping projects that they could participate in. And we can talk about the issue. We can um, understand like what's going on. What does the landscape look like? Why is it important to have that map? What, what are they needing? Um, what are they trying to do? And, and what, what information do they need? And uh, I think it's really a, a wonderful experience to kind of link that because once students know that why, um, they're ready to map. They're ready to help others. They're saying, hey, we've got the technology uh, and we can sit here and help people for the next hour. Let's do it. Uh, and so these are different organizations that you can look into um, for different projects. So this one is an example of a lesson plan that I have used several times, um, probably when I was first starting uh, open street map, to use open street mapping in my classroom. Uh, the Choices program has these free lessons, pl free lesson plans called Teaching with the News. And they tend to update these ever so once in a while. And when there was the Syrian refugee crisis, um, I used this. Uh, my students were as asking about it. Uh, it was in the news quite a bit. We were talking about refugees in our human geography curriculum. And so I went in and started to use the Choices program where I talked about um, showing statistics, like where are the refugees coming from? Where are they going to? Um, talking, having them map it out. Um, and then on this lesson plan, they had personal refugee stories, which was really neat, as well as videos for the students to watch. Once students really kind of started to understand that crisis, um, they realize, hey, um, there's some mapping projects. And that's what, if um, on the next slide, there were some mapping projects for so these refu Syrian refugees that I was able to go on and find on the hot. And my students were able to participate mapping for the refugees. And it was really neat because the students had learned about something uh, or in the curriculum about refugees, what are the push and pull factors of where they're going and why they're going. And then they actually kind of learned like a little case study about different refugees, why one refugee went to this country, why another refugee went to another country. And then they started to um, kind of have a, a deeper understanding. And so when we went to MAP, they were very excited and motivated and engaged. And I think that that's the biggest thing for a teacher is how do you to engage your students? Um, they realize that what they have learned uh, and what they could do to actually help people on the ground really made a difference in how they were uh, internalizing and learning about that, that topic. And so now I want to turn to uh, uh, one of the things I like to do in my classroom is uh, I'm an avid traveler. I like to travel uh, for fun, but mostly I like to travel for research and, and uh, to bring the real world to my classroom so I, they can have kind of through a six degrees of separation experience where a lot of my students will, will not even travel outside of the city, uh, which is unfortunate. So uh, I had a chance in uh, 2015 to travel to uh, Morocco. Um, to not just tour uh, Morocco, but also uh, visit with some people in the Sahara, uh, part of um, uh, the ongoing conflict between uh, the Sawari people and the government of Morocco, which you may have heard of, uh, flared up recently as, as early as last spring, and it's still kind of going on today. Um, and so uh, we did a, a, a deep dive into um, the situation in the Sahara, uh, no matter how you look at it, whether you call it the Moroccan Sahara, Western Sahara, um, and the Tindu camps in, in terms of rural settlements. And so I, I briefly give the students a, a little history about it, uh, why the why of what's going on with the people. You know, Morocco has claimed it as historically their land, and so um, it's, it's uh, controlled by Morocco, it's occupied by Morocco, uh, administered by Morocco, um, and, and, and then uh, give the flip side in terms of Sorari people, how they fled um, to Algeria, protected by the Algerian government, 
um, uh, under the guise of a group known as the Polisario Front, um, and then the UN's mission there. And then I further, and this is a great uh, uh, way to show them uh, why we need to map this area. Uh, and so on the right, you have uh, Google, and you know, you'll see that there's very little imagery on Google um, in terms of these, these informal settlements. Um, and we talk about informality uh, of settlements, particularly in urban areas as well. Um, and then on the left with OpenStreetMap, we'll see that these, again, these invisible people have been made visible in this same particular area. Um, and then I, I talk about um, my travels there and meeting with uh, Sawari people who are former uh, residents of the Tendu camps who've come back to Morocco and integrated, reintegrated back into Morocco. And then I also show the other side uh, of showing narratives of people that are in the Tendu camps to kind of give an even keel about that. And then we'll find some mapping projects um, that will uh, assist in helping them identify the Sorori people. Uh, so here's one we used in my class, uh, refugee camp boundary mapping, uh, using the hot uh, OSM tasking manager, uh, which is one of my favorites and one of the great ways to find um, some really quick, especially urgent uh, humanitarian uh, projects to map in your classroom. So many teachers will say, well, that's great. Um, that's really cool. You're doing humanitarian mapping. Um, how can I use it in our community? And uh, I think that that's something that's really cool is that if you have in your community something you would like to map, um, you can create your own project. So like I said earlier in the presentation, uh, I'm originally from a small rural town called Mount Pulaski, Illinois. And I realized that um, my hometown was not mapped. And I talk about Mount Pulaski the entire year. Um, my students actually laugh about it. Um, I actually had a former student from who was going to school from a, a, a girl from Chicago, Illinois. And she goes, oh, I know a lot about Illinois. Do you, have you ever heard of Mount Pulaski, Illinois? And the, the girl laughed at her, said, how do you know about Mount Pulaski? Uh, she goes, oh, I, have, I learned about it in human geography. So my students learn about it and I show lots of pictures and uh, they found out we were talking about food deserts and trying to show them that food deserts not only happen in urban spaces, but also in rural. And what we did is we went in and started to map Mount Pulaski, Illinois. Um, and this is kind of just showing you, um, I created the project with the help of Steven Johnson from the Teach OSM team. And, uh, and then explained and the students were familiar with Mount Pulaski. They wanted to help Mount Pulaski. They interviewed uh, several people from Mount Pulaski that were trying to revive a, uh, a, a community garden so that they could sell these vegetables uh, in um, these fresh vegetables for the to the community. Otherwise, everyone in the community has to drive at least 15 miles to get to the closest grocery store to get fresh fruits and vegetables. So the students got to interact with some of the people in the community. And we use that as a service learning project that they got credit for through College Board. Um, they get a little um, a distinguished award uh, through College Board saying they did a service learning project with the curriculum that they learned about. And it was really fun and really neat. Um, and it had a lot of meaning for my students. So it's important for teachers to realize that if they wanted to, to do this in their own community, they can. Um, right now, we're looking at starting a new project uh, with some students that I have looking at my current location where I teach in Mashby, Massachusetts, um, sidewalks. We've had a student that was run over by a car and killed, unfortunately. And the students are wanting to look at how can we get more um, accessibility through sidewalks, like making the town more walkable so that students can get from point A to point B and uh, to school and to the center of town um, safely on sidewalks. And so that's just something that, um, you know, that was the students kind of looking at 
what they wanted to do in their community and and teachers can create these own their own projects and um this and it shows how the students can become civically engaged in their own community This is um, this is an example of I had a student who learned about open street mapping her freshman year. So I teach human geography the freshman to the freshman, and over the time uh, she wanted to start a mapathon, and I think that that's kind of really neat when educators are thinking about why would I want to start open street mapping? What's the point? How is this? An, you know, and I always say you know. This is something where a student learned about it her freshman year, um, really wanted to continue on with using open street mapping. And so at our school, we have senior seminar where students have to do a senior project. And this was a young woman who was very passionate. Um, she wanted to do something to help others. And uh, so she created a community uh, mapathon. And she actually uh, is very artistic and into the arts. And she reached out to artists who um, uh, she took her topic. She found a topic that she wanted to map about and um, introduced it through art, um, having uh, a, a, a po uh, poetry uh, written about the topic. Um, people sang about the topic. Um, people danced. Um, it was a very beautiful night, and we had over a hundred people come into the auditorium. And she had kind of taken some of her classmates who had learned about open street mapping, and they were helping the older people learn how to navigate through open street mapping. So I called them my little OSM ambassadors. But it was a really neat night. And um, this is when people are saying, "Why would I want to incorporate open street mapping?" Uh, it can it can make a difference in a student's in life that they'll continue to use it outside of your classroom. So how to connect projects to your curriculum. Uh, one of the first things we do is look for or create a project. Um, if you're interested in creating a project, you can contact um, the, the great folks at Teach OSM uh which we are a part of um and we can help assist you in creating that project and getting it out there uh at task.teachosm.org um and see where can where is there a part of the world that you like to map or is there a project locally uh i know there's been schools um in in all over the country that say they wanted to map different things on our campus that aren't a part of uh open street map um there's uh, like I mentioned before, there's a lot of development going on around our campus that my students are itching to delineate and, and, and get digitized on OpenStreetMap. Um, and then uh, research some background information, find out the purpose of the project, uh, find some background articles um, that we've listed here, um, and have the kids read about what's going on. So for example, I know Celeste did one on uh, volcanic eruption in Indonesia. Uh, so she had her students read uh, some background information, um, you know, watch some news uh, article, uh, news uh, reports from NPR and other uh, sources, and and so it clicked with these kids when they when they start to map um, that oh okay this is why we need to do it. And so once the students start mapping the project, um, it's really really cool if you create a hashtag. This way, you kind of keep track of the edits. That's one easy way you can do it. And, and then also you can do it with uh, another tool, how did you contribute uh, when open street maps, which I will uh, show you here using my um, uh, uh, username. Give me a second, let me share that. Let me share my screen. And I think you should be able to see it here in about few seconds well, let's see you want to do a choose application or tab sorry guys this is a brand new platform for me so give me a second hey greg we could actually see your screen when you were doing oh okay that. okay cool so cool. you're good all right so um 
here it is. Uh, hopefully you guys can see it. You'll see. Um, there we go. And so I'll drop this uh, link in chat along with some other tools um, that you can use to. Let me see in the chat button. The chat, chat, chat. Here, uh, conversations. Uh, let's see. Oh, we got a comment here from Jennings. I have a handful of animation stats on the 2020 Haiti mapping that you have to share for your use in your classroom. I'd love that. Please uh, send it to my way. I'll drop my uh, email here at the end. Thank you for that. That'd be awesome. Uh, so what I've dropped is uh, the, the link um, to, uh, it's called Overview of the Results Maps. And I think Pascal Nice is the guy that created this. But so the question I get a lot of times from kids is, is this for a grade? And so, yeah, it's for a grade. And so teachers often ask, well, how can I grade it? So one of the things I do logistically, uh, which I'll talk about here in a second, is a little bit about logistics, is uh, first of all, I have them set up an account. And then I like to secure their usernames. I, I'll have a Google form. I actually created a hyperdoc. And if you're interested in that, email me and I can send it to you. I created a hyperdoc that takes them step by step on First, you need to go to openstreetmap.org, um, create a, you, you think of a username, come up with an email that's not a school mail, email because our school and their infinite wisdom blocks OpenStreetMap. Uh, the validation part, we can use it in class, but in terms of having to go to the student's email, it's something screwed anyway. Uh, so I have them use an outside email and I have them on a Google form um, put in their username um, and the email they use to uh, create their OpenStreetMap account. Uh, that way you'll have a kid that'll come in on next Friday. Oh, I forgot what my username is. I don't care remember what email it is. And I'll have it right there and we can kind of mitigate that. Um, and so once they, uh, you know, once, you know, we're done, do, you know, say, okay, kids, you need to do 50 edits today or 100 edits or however many edits it is. And so kind of a cool thing is I can take, uh, first take their username, plot it in here and search, and I use my own here. And I can look at today. I did uh, a workshop earlier this morning, and I can see that I did two chain sets. Um, and it'll show, you know, the latest and greatest as I scroll down. Uh, and, and there's a lot more in here that you can mitigate uh, using this. Um, if I go to results map, um, there again, there are a lot more uh, bells and whistles and tools. Uh, one of my students' favorites is uh, OSM Fight. And I'll give a minute for that to kind of pop up. And on up. Let me. I don't know if it went to that. Nope, it didn't shift to it. Let me change that really quick. Share Google tab. Learning on the fly here, guys. Learning on the fly. All right, so here is OSM Fight. This is my students' favorite thing to do. They always, after we get done um, uh, doing a project, they want to see who had the most edits or they want to go against their best bud. Uh, so I'm going to put my my arch nemesis in OSM in there, uh, who is on this call, and click on Fight. And it will populate with some different uh, categories. Greg, Greg and I are yes. good friends, and uh, we have a competition of who's going to get to um, advanced mapper. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so first it was intermediate. Now it's advanced. And so for months, uh, she would win, and now I'm I just. I don't know, maybe because of recent uh, mapping my students, uh, I am for, uh, forged ahead uh, in doing that. So um, that's another cool thing. And it also is a good motivator for kids to to actually, you know, do good work. Another thing I also tell my students is uh, Big Brother is watching. And so uh, I had an incident where a, a student mapped a 40,000 foot waterfall in a place where there is no water. Um, and, and I tell the kids, hey, this is this is life and death. Um, this is not uh, a, a playroom. So 
We're doing real work here. We're doing real geography, um, so to speak. And if I could share another screen here, another way I can use to check, um, particularly on my own uh, projects. Let me stop sharing that. And then share this other tab. There it is. Um, this is a project I created uh, within Teach OSM um, in Western Maryland. I used it with uh, the American Le Maryland Geographic Alliance. Um, is scroll down and use chain sets in OSM Cha, um, which is a great tool again to gauge who did what. Um, and and it, you know it's it's there's a lot of uh, great uh, tutorials on how to use OSM Cha and other things. It shows. You know, when, when I did this uh, particular workshop a couple hours ago, you'll see who did what. And the good thing is, you know, my good friend Melly doesn't mind. It shows you exactly what they did and where they did it. Um, it'll take a minute to kind of populate my slow computer. Hopefully. But you get the idea. It'll it'll show you exactly what they did and where they did. Maybe maybe this one will work. Let's see here. No, nope. um, it's taking forever. But anyway, you get the idea. I'm I'm a I'm a shop stop sharing my screen with that, and go back to our main. For first, there is uh, are there any questions whatsoever? You can drop them in chat. Um, any comments? Any resources you may want to add? All right, we'll have some time at the end. If you come up with something, please, please can't talk words. Please feel free to throw those in there, uh, if you will. We're just glad you guys are here on this fine Saturday morning. Uh, so that's kind of some of the things, and it kind of leads into the next slide. Uh, again, you know, setting up usernames and securing those usernames takes a lot of headache out of, you know, uh, I forgot what my username is. You know how especially in ninth grade. Uh, we primarily teach ninth graders. My seniors really don't have that problem, uh, but ninth graders, oh my God. Um, and then training, we talk about best practices all the time. We, um, I uh, include uh, some of the training videos that are out there, whether it be with Matt Give um, and, and uh, Hot OSM has some great training uh, videos out on YouTube. Um, Teach OSM has some training modules that are coming out pretty soon. We're revamping a lot of those, so I'll look forward to those. And we'll talk a little bit more about Teach OSM coming up here in a minute. Actually, here we are. So um, here we are. All right, so here are a couple of resources, additional resources. Uh, again, starting with Teach OSM. Uh, if you go to teachosm.org. Um, uh, we provide a lot of lesson plans for teachers. Uh, we're starting to um, uh, update a lot of those, especially with the update to the uh, AP Human Geography uh, uh, CED um, class and exam description, which is kind of the guidepost for how teachers teach that course. Uh, we also offer tutorials on how to use OSM. I had mentioned before, we have a new partnership with Microsoft, and which we're trying to develop uh, uh, some some classroom mo class modules for teachers themselves uh, who don't want to necessarily have time to come to a, a a long workshop or whatever they can do it at their own time. We also have weekly mappy hours um, hosted by the American Geological Society, and this is where uh, teachers can come and 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 get immersed in 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 a really relaxed and 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 easygoing way. You know, you can bring your favorite beverage. Um, and, and just have a great time with uh, other educators. And then we also met the teachers on how to use OSM um, and, and can come to your classroom and help you in that endeavor. And I, I want to add too that a lot of times we understand when teachers are learning a new technology, um, it's kind of difficult if you feel like you don't have a good handle on that technology. So Mappy Hours is a very wonderful way for teachers to come in, you know, get familiar with logging into your OpenStreetMap account and making sure, you know, you and working on building, you know, 
creating buildings or uh, doing streets or doing points. Um, I know that every time I go to a mappy hour, I'm learning something new about how to manipulate the tools um, in open street mapping. And it, it makes me more confident as um, I'm introducing it to my students that I have a, a strong uh, handle on the technology um, and making sure that when if a student is asking me a question about how do I do this or I did this and um, what did I just do and I have the answers. I know that when we have to introduce new technology and we don't know a lot about it, we don't feel very confident of introducing it. So the Mappy Hours gives you a chance to, to get more comfortable and, um, and, and think about how you could use it. And I think that that's very, very important for educators to really, um, uh, and a, a wonderful relaxed time to get more familiar with open street mapping so that you can introduce it to your students in the classroom. Um, the other thing, American Geographical Society, uh, has a teacher's fellow, uh, and this is a great opportunity for teachers to apply um, because there is uh, where I, I know Greg and I learned more about open street mapping. Uh, I think that they're going to go back live next year and they have an entire morning where you can meet the Teach OSM team and you can learn um, about how to use buildings and you can ask them all sorts of questions. Um, you can still, you know, it's it's wonderful even if you already know open street mapping, but it's also another opportunity for you to ask lots of questions and and get yourself familiar with it and 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 how to use it within your curriculum. And then the last thing too is uh, Greg and I have um, uh, talked to the Teach OSM committee and they were looking like, hey, you know, we'd like to start an after school program. And um, this was something that Greg and I have also talked about because we realized that sometimes um, teachers are afraid to learn new technology or, inc or incorporate it. But sometimes the students aren't. The students want to do something like that. And sometimes the students can push the teachers to uh, try to integrate new technology or or bring something new to the to the to their school, so um, we started uh, this thing uh, organization called OSM Team Mactivist, and this is where uh, we're trying to once again um, we it, it's new and Greg and I decided that we wanted to uh, open it up to teenagers across the United States, um, try to introduce them what open street mapping is. Um, why they would want to learn about open street mapping and then get them familiar just to like how to use open street mapping. So we've been happy having uh, monthly mappy hours um, where we have a guest mapper who actually uses open street mapping in their line of work. And that has been really helpful because I know I can say, oh, you can use open street mapping for this or that or this or that. And my students hear me talking about it all the time, but to hear have other people talk about how they're using it within their line of work has really opened their eyes. Like, wow, Mrs. Reynolds, you know, you keep talking about it, but now I'm really starting to see uh, how open street mapping is a wonderful tool and how I can help others. Um, I had one student just say to me, after one of the mappy hours, I never thought about going into geography and international affairs or Peace Corps. And uh, I actually have found using doing mappy hours is very relaxing and I learn a lot. So um, Greg and I have been doing those, but we're hoping to build it so that eventually um, different high schools can have different chapters. So my school and Greg's school could do a, 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 a mapathon together. Um, we're looking to, um, uh, you know, an organization where they could bring in, have their own community mapathons, um, where they would bring um, everybody in their community uh, and just trying to get students um, engaged. And maybe that would be a wonderful way of getting their teachers to start incorporating it into their classroom as well. Um, saying, hey, um, Mr. Hill, uh, this is, we found this was going on and da, 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 and we'd like to map um, crosswalks. We've noticed that in open street mapping, we don't have 
um, some major crosswalks in our community that are mapped. Um, we'd like to have a, a mapping project where we're doing crosswalks. Um, and, and having those students take the initiative in, in, in their community, but also in the world. Um, and so this is where we're looking for uh, open street mapping professionals, people who are using it, if they would be interested in joining us. We usually ask people to speak about 20, 25 minutes um, talking about um, kind of uh, their background and how they're using open street mapping and then um, provide some type of project that goes along with their with their talk. And um, we get the students on there and um, they can do some mapping. And I always like to talk about this because, you know, Greg, Greg and I are saying, well, this is mostly of uh, the why. We're trying to get them why you should map, why you should map. Because um, if a teenager uh, is not convinced why they need to do something, they will not do it. Um, I've had students where they I've introduced open street mapping, but I haven't emphasized the why. And they just will sit there and not map. But I have found that if I, it's a hard sell, um, but if I sell it right and I really sell the why to them, then they'll be mapping all day. And they'll map anytime I ask them to map. So I think that that's really important for teachers, especially at the high school level to, to know. And the more that they meet people that are using it and how it's being used, um, the more motivated that they will be um, when you're doing the process of mapping. So. Thank you. Wanna, you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> we want to thank Bye. you guys for coming today. Um, here's our contact information. If you want to take a, a screenshot of it, a screen capture, uh, I'll also drop it in the chat. If you just want to grab it from there. Um, and you know, reach out to us if you have any uh, suggestions, if you have any questions. Um, you know, we're here to help. We would just want to make this uh, a better place for open street maps. And Celeste, any parting words? Yes, I just want to say thank you for uh, joining us today. Uh, we, uh, Greg and I, are very passionate about trying to. Um, help teachers incorporate open street mapping into their classroom. We have, we feel like it has really elevated our instruction and helped our students um, in so many ways. And we see it, you know, it's exciting because we, our students come back to us from college and they get really excited uh, that thank you for introducing us to this opportunity. And so we want to really um, stress that um, it might be frightening and sometimes you don't necessarily understand how to do it. But if you need that extra support, um, we will be happy to help you. Stephen Johnson from the Teach OSM committee is fabulous. He will, he will help people out setting up new projects. Um, if you have questions, uh, he's so helpful and available and supportive. But um, the thing is, is that um, there's a lot of different ways to get involved and you will really elevate your teaching and get in student engagement, uh, which I think is one of the best things that we can do as educators. So thank you. And uh, there's also a Teach OSM Slack. There's a, a Teach OSM Facebook. There's Teach OSM uh, Twitter. Uh, tw teach OSM Instagram. So you can't get us those ways, any of those other ways, uh, feel free um, to reach out to us through social media. 